Now, of course, we introduced Colonel Douglas McGregor to you several times on the mother of all talk shows before he got his big break with Tucker Carlson. But he hasn't forgotten us. He's agreed to come back and talk to us on the mother of all talk shows this evening, and I'm very glad to say he joins me now. Uh, Colonel McGregor, uh, it was the big time. Uh, you've been in the big time uh, for a long time, in the Pentagon, in the White House, in your military career, on the mother of all talk shows. But there you are now in the stratosphere with Tucker. But it didn't overawe you. You took the program by the scruff of the neck, and Carlson was spellbound by your grasp of detail. Tell us on a human level, uh, first of all, how has that been for you, being such a star on a Carlson show? Well, George, uh, I usually think of myself as a star when I'm with you. So I guess in that sense, it wasn't anything new. <laughs> Very kind. Now, before we go to the battleground, Colonel, uh, let's talk about the battleground, if you like, at the UN and in the US Congress. Zelensky was as popular as a pork chop at a Muslim wedding uh, with a lot of the delegates in the United Nations this week. And it turns out there's not enough votes in the Congress to give him the money he's really there to collect. He's losing on the political battlefield, isn't he? Yeah, I think uh, James Brown said it best, the thrill is gone. And uh, our friend uh, Zelensky is uh, very definitely in the loser's corner. Nobody wants to state it publicly, but everybody knows tragically, Ukraine has, has lost hundreds of thousands of men, I would argue pointlessly, in a war for all the wrong reasons. The Russians are sitting comfortably behind their defenses and everyone is wondering when the Russians will attack and finish this war. But I think from the very beginning, Putin never had any intention of conquering Western Ukraine and moving into Eastern Europe, contrary to what the propagandists in your country and mine have said. There's no payoff. Uh, territorial imperialism is a loser. He simply wants this war to end. He wants to liberate the Russians living in Eastern Ukraine from the oppressive rule of Mr. Zelensky and his friends. And he would like to get back to normalcy wants to get back to doing business. And I think the Europeans need to wake up as soon as possible because the sooner they wake up, the more uh, improvement they will see in their lives. But they've got a long way to go with the governments ruling them. And unfortunately, we're ruled by people not very different from the ones you're discussing in, in Great Britain right now. They also need to go. We need normality. We need to get away from all of this artificial nonsense we need to get away from what Roger Scruton used to call the nonsense machine. You've got a nonsense machine in London and apparently also in Edinburgh, sadly. Uh, we have a nonsense machine in Washington. It all needs to stop because all of this is about money, unfortunately, in the United States. And lots of people are getting rich in Washington, D.C., while the Ukrainian people are being killed and their nation is being destroyed. Well, I didn't intend to be speaking to you about this, but I did see that you had weighed in uh, in one of your uh, one, one of your political initiatives that you're welcome to brief us on uh, on this nonsense uh, machine. I've seen a lot, Colonel, as a man of my age and more than fifty years in politics. I ought to have seen a lot, but I have never seen a conquering of the public space, the institutions the commanding heights of the society uh, as quickly and as comprehensively as I have seen over this nonsense machine, the, the transmania, the gender-bending, uh, all-consuming triumph uh, of uh, people that we were all uh, absolutely content to see an end to discrimination against, all happy to see 
uh, a dampening of bigotry towards, but we are now in a situation, Colonel, you may not be in your country, but I am in mine, that it is a crime for which I can be sent to prison if I do not call a man, a woman, because that man has decreed himself to be a woman. It is a crime that could put you behind bars. How did we get there? Well, it looks like the people that dominate our financial system and control the money uh, are the same people who currently dominate the government, who are shaping society, who are controlling academia. They've effectively taken over the airwaves. And so they can make something that's utterly ridiculous, like this war in Ukraine, and portray it as though it's some victory for them and for their their uh, ruling class. When in fact we know the Ukrainians have been slaughtered in this war. We've set them up for failure. We tried to build an army on the fly. We sent them into action, promising them virtually everything and anything. And they've reached the point now where they have nothing left to fight with. And so now we're handing them cruise missiles and they're going to hurl those pointlessly at targets in Russia or wherever they can reach. It's not going to change anything, but it could ultimately induce the Russians to finally say, let's attack and end this thing once and for all. Russian commanders are telling President Putin they want to drive their tanks right into Kiev and destroy this regime once and for all which they now view, and I think they're right, as a danger not only to them, but a danger to the people living in Ukraine and living in Europe. These people are dangerous. They represent everything that you're talking about. They have a spokesperson who is a man dressed as a woman. Whether or not this person has been through some sort of transgender surgery, I have no idea. But this thing spouts utter nonsense and is held up as an example by Zelensky in the West as something we all ought to worship. This has got to stop. This doesn't make any sense. It's the nonsense machine in charge. Uh, we've turned the world upside down. I, I don't have any easy answers other than to say we've got to resist. I know my ancestors resisted a hell of a lot in Scotland over many centuries. And I suppose that's why I'm sitting where I am in the United States now, because they finally decided to give up and leave. But I hope that the people in Great Britain will resist and stand up and essentially talk about the nonsense and stop it, because we've got to. We've been lied to about everything. We're being lied to about gender and biology and genetics, uh, lied about what's right, what's wrong. And we don't need PhDs, and we don't need to spend time in seminaries to figure out what's right, what's wrong, and what's real. Indeed, let's uh, move to another part of the battlefield. The ground seems to be shifting uh, in the Congress uh, over the latest of what have been a series of voracious financial demands by Zelensky. I read just before coming on air that, uh, that uh, Biden will not have enough votes to get another huge payment, a huge payout. Is that how you see it? There are 37 million people inside the United States living below the poverty line. There are 11 million children, American children, who go to bed hungry every night. Now, what's wrong with this picture? We want to send billions and hundreds of billions to Ukraine to fight a war that makes no sense against a people that are not the enemy of the American people, or for that matter, in my judgment, Europe. We should be interested in peace not shipping hundreds of billions of dollars overseas. People in the country are beginning to say, wait a minute, 37 million Americans live in poverty, 11 million children are going to bed hungry every night. This is outrageous nonsense. It needs to stop. That's what's happening. And is that putting pressure on the Republican uh, leadership in the House? Uh, which has been uh, bipartisan on foreign policy issues, at least, uh, with the Democrats in lockstep. Are they beginning to move now? Well, I think we still have what we call the uniparty. That is, uh, the Republicans and Democrats are all interested in the same thing. They want to 
line their pockets with as much cash as possible and go home as multimillionaires. You know, this is not the way this government was originally designed. We didn't build this government with that in mind, but that's what's happened for the last 30, 40 years. All sorts of people have showed up in Washington who are only modestly wealthy, if if we can use that word at all. But they all ended up retiring after five or six terms in office with millions of dollars. This is a, this has become an industry, a self-licking ice cream cone, if you call, if you want. And we're doing the same thing with defense right now. I mean, we we had the chief financial officer of Lockheed Martin, one of the top five defense firms, speak publicly and talk about the wonderful prospects for profits in the future. He said, "We've got ten billion dollars more." orders on the way now thanks to ukraine and after we've gotten these 10 billion dollars for the for the missiles we're shipping to ukraine we're going to get 10 billion more to replace all the missiles we just sent now most of this most of this cash just sort of circulates in washington it goes from congress to the department of defense from the department of defense to its constituents and its donors the donors turn around and enrich the people on the hill they refill their election campaign funds or re-election campaign funds. This this is a giant money laundering scheme. It's not doing anything for the people of Ukraine. It's not doing anything for the people here in the United States. We, we've got 28 million, an estimated 28 million people living in the United States who are illegally here. And most of them, I would say over 90% of them enjoy free health care at the expense of American taxpayers. At the same time, we've got 27 million Americans who have no health insurance. What is wrong with this picture? This is ridiculous. We are, we are impoverishing ourselves and enriching a small elite, but that elite is owned by the people you're talking about, by the ruling class that controls finance. That's why we financialized our economy. We don't build anything anymore. We're not producing steel and other components. We are financialized. Everything's about transaction fees, George. It's the same thing in London. You saw the eco you saw the financial crisis in, in September that removed uh, your previous prime minister and brought in Sunak. Has anything really changed since that financial crisis? And and that was essentially saved by the. Uh, Bank of England, that they promised to buy up some number of gilts. Well, we've got the same problem here in the United States. Rising interest rates, you know, the bond yields are going up, but the prices for bonds are going down, and fewer and fewer people overseas want to buy our bonds. You know, how long will it be before the banks in the United States and in Great Britain figure out that they're holding on to tremendous numbers of liabilities, not assets? They bought all these gilts and bonds when the interest rates were at zero or one or less than 2%. Now what are they worth with the interest rates rising rapidly to five? And there's no evidence that these interest rates can be contained. They're going to continue to go up. We're, we're headed for a serious crisis. And I think the people in charge are making serious mistakes because they're still focused on themselves not on the country and the people that live in our countries. In this tinderbox, which you so, so eloquently describe, what would be the impact of a successful effort to keep uh, Donald Trump out of the next presidential race, either by, by lawfare, uh, by even the possibility of imprisonment, uh, by some other means, including the possibility of extreme prejudice, which you can never uh, rule out in the United States. Uh, what would be the impact uh, on the tinderbox? Will that to happen, do you think? You know, we can only speculate. We can't know with absolute certainty. But remember that the majority of Americans that voted for Donald Trump are frankly people that obey the law. They're not the people that you saw destroy $2.1 billion worth of property in the United States in 2020. The average Trump voter is a, is a law-abiding citizen. 
So I, I don't expect some outburst of violence. But, you know, there's something else happening that you may not be aware of, but there is a candidate, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and he is very similar to Trump in many of his views. Not They're not exactly the same by any means, but I would describe both of them as legitimate, valid candidates for two distinct parties, except that the two parties don't like them, don't want them. You know, Robert F. Kennedy isn't sure that he has a real shot in the primaries to get the nomination because he's afraid it's going to be rigged against him. And he's brought this up. Someone just tried to kill him the other day, and he's being denied Secret Service protection. We all know that President Trump has been at risk for a long time. I, I don't really know. I think what we're looking at, though, in the future, sometime over the next six to 12 months, is the perfect storm. On the one side, the financial system is going to go into crisis. I don't see how we escape it. On the other side, we have the political dispute with this uniparty, with people that we can't seem to control, people that are completely unresponsive to the, to the population and its needs. If you ask the average American, what do you think about Ukraine? He's probably going to ask you, where is it? The next American you ask about Ukraine, he says, well, I don't think we should go to war over this place. I mean, there's there's no there's no uh, support for a war against Russia, seven thousand or eight thousand miles from the United States. There's no support for a war with China over some island off the coast called Taiwan. Americans, and I I don't know what it's like in Britain, but I can tell you, Americans are very worried about putting bread on the table. You talked about the immense wealth concentrated in the hands of the few. We've got a lot of people in the United States living now paycheck to paycheck. The average American has perhaps four, five thousand dollars in savings. How long is that going to last? Particularly given the, the financialization of our economy, the rising interest rates. How does the average American get credit? Credit is tightening. That's no accident as the interest rates go up. So I think we're headed into some sort of perfect storm. So to sit here and predict how people will react, it's hard to tell. But if they can't eat, if they can't put food on the table, if they can't get to work because they can't afford to put gas in their automobiles, if they can't afford to stay in the homes that they own, I think you're headed for a lot of trouble.